Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. This is the enemy radios of the Vietnam Wars and the Army Security Agency, or ASA, for the Antique Wireless Museum YouTube channel. In 1970, I grad graduated from high school. Um, I also registered for the draft. I wasn't ready to go to college. Uh, luckily, my neighbor was a Southern Bell uh, supervisor. He knew of my ham radio hobby. He recommended that I um, uh, apply for Southern Bell, and uh, I was able to, to work as a 4A frameman for, for a year. From 1968 to 1970, I was very active as a novice, all CW, of course, and uh, I, I even had a 25 word per minute um, CW certificate from the AWRL. Now, this was based on conversational content, not uh, five letter code groups, which are much more difficult. So, um, in November 1971, I got called up, and uh, my draft number was 33, and I think they went to 50 that year. And I think it was actually the last year that they actually took any, any draftees. So, we had uh, physicals, of course. We also had mental aptitude tests. They also asked what you wanted to do and, and where you wanted to serve. So, not that they were necessarily going to give you that. Physical was no problem. Um, I remember testing for officer candidate school, but I wasn't really too worried about that because I really didn't want to have a long uh, commitment uh, to the military at that point. Um, I had told folks I'd like to be a radio operator, so someone arranged for a Morse code test, and they mentioned the Army Security Agency. Uh, but they said uh, to be considered, I'd have to make 100% on the, on the code test. Because normally they train you their, their way, but if you were good enough, I guess there was a fast, a fast path. Well, bottom line is I wasn't ready for the five-letter code groups. I hadn't practiced that, and so I choked the, the Morse code test. So after a lot of discussions, uh, I ended up in the infantry as a 11 Charlie or mortarman. And um, shortly thereafter, I went ahead and volunteered for Vietnam uh, since a lot of my buddies had already gone there and come back and um, so uh, on the flight over President Nixon made an announcement that American infantry would no longer be used in offensive operations but just would be there to support the Vietnamese and also to uh, you know uh, provide our own security for our bases so I ended up in one of the two infantry companies around the biggest base in Vietnam called Long Bin very big base, and, um, you know, the, the towers were a lot of fun. Some of them had spotlights. Some of them had uh, infrared uh, equipment. Um, but, you know, after a while, it was getting pretty uh, pretty boring. Also, I don't remember the food as, at all, actually. Um, I remember eating a bunch of sea rations that they drove around um, by a truck uh, every day, and uh, uh, these were all dated 1945-46, so they, you know, so I was ready to, to look for something else. About that time, um, we had a lieutenant that came in from the first cab. He was a uh, artilleryman, a red leg as we call them, and uh, he wanted to set up a um, uh, some fire support, uh, a four-deuce heavy mortar, which is a pretty big uh, mortar. And um, I was trained as a mortarman, so I volunteered and got accepted. Uh, helped set up our, our base and our three guns and, and, and all that, generator and antennas and telephone lines out to the guns and all that. It was a lot of fun. And we were out by ourselves, so nobody really messed with us. Uh, we had a fire direction center, and uh, the lieutenant even arranged for a starlight scope so we could sit up in that bunker at night um, and, uh, and watch for any, uh, you know, unusual activity. And we had monkeys and deer and mongooses and uh, all sorts of other things, uh, but luckily no people. But it was a lot of fun doing that. I worked myself up to inside the fire direction center. Uh, of course, a lot of telephones and radios, maps, plotting boards, and uh, uh, we even had electronic sensors around the base, which we had pre-plotted on our maps. And we get calls from time to time um, from the hill, as we called it, 
and they would say, you've got movement at sensor number 147, so we'd crank up the guns and fire a few rounds, and they'd call back and say, sensor destroyed, but nobody would go out and, and see what it was. So, so a couple of months later, we all got replaced by four of these that came in uh, with a lot of South Vietnamese around them, so we were pretty proud. So I had been down south, uh, and um, uh, my next duty station was going to be up with a, an aviation unit up, uh, up north, a place called Tan Mi. And um, they were like one of the only, um, well, there was probably five or six uh, aviation companies left in Vietnam at that point. They were still doing offensive operations uh, in support of the South Vietnamese and they needed security, and they didn't like South Vietnamese being the security. They'd rather have Americans, so that's the only reason why I ended up in that, uh, in that next outfit. Uh, plus, I had time to serve toward my year enlistment here in Vietnam. So, and up north was where a lot of the heavy fighting was happening, or had happened in, the, in spring and summer, and, and uh, e even in the fall, they're still cleaning up when I got up there. As I passed through Da Nang Air Base, I noticed uh, these uh, Army fixed-wing aircraft, and I didn't know the Army had any of these. And I asked somebody what they used them for, and they just said surveillance. Uh, they didn't exactly say which, which kind of surveillance, so, but that was news to me. So here's uh, Tan Mi, about 60 miles north of Da Nang, very idyllic place. Um, South China Sea uh, on one side and a big inlet on another side big fishing village for the Vietnamese. Um, a number of different units had been in, in that dislocation over the years. Uh, the last one were, was the 101st Airborne. They used Tan Mi as a in-country R&R &R center, um, uh, and they called it Eagle Beach. So it was a pretty nice place. We even had connexes full of uh, basketballs and tennis rackets and all sorts of Frisbees, all sorts of things. Of course, we didn't use them. So, um, so the unit I was with was F Troop Fourth Cab Air, um, and um, we had a lot of Cobras, of course, and Loaches, the observation helicopters, and uh, plenty of slicks and um, or UEs. I uh, begged and begged, and finally got on as, on one of the UEs as a door gunner, and and did fifty missions before the unit stood down. Here's the aircraft I was on. Uh, it's unique in that it has uh, what we call a toilet bowl on it, um, which was a uh, heat diffuser, diffuser um, because the enemy had uh, started using uh, shoulder-fired heat-seeking missiles. And uh, so this was an attempt to, um, you know, to uh, evade that type of thing. So all of our uh, aircraft had these. We were like the first unit in Vietnam, I think, to have them. So the good missions were the pink team missions, um, where you had uh, loaches doing the observation low and cobras up high in a figure eight pattern until they were called down to, to uh, attack something. And uh, we were in a slick. Uh, we, we were considered the command and control aircraft. We were kind of standoffish and just watching what was going on. Uh, on board was either a, a forward observer for artillery or um, a handful of uh, infantrymen we called the Blues in case one of the aircrafts uh, had a problem or got shot down. We were supposed to provide security uh, for that, but luckily that didn't happen uh, while we were there. So um, sometimes they had heavy pink team missions where they'd have, um, instead of two Cobras and two Loaches, they'd have four Cobras and four Loaches. So uh, these were the interesting missions. But of course, most of the missions were more mundane. We'd fly advisors around. Uh, we, we, I remember flying beer and ice uh, up to the top of a, a fire base for some special forces guys. Um, flew around a Jolly Green Giant doing uh, a um, um, evacuation from the jungle with a uh, jungle penetrator pulling up by the cable for a few minutes and that type of thing. So here's one of the pilots that I flew with. He's checking out a piece of captured equipment, this 20 millimeter cannon. And um, behind him are a couple of vehicles. Uh, they're either Soviet personnel carriers or Chinese copies of the Soviet uh, uh, personnel carriers. And unfortunately, I didn't have the wherewithal to stick my head in there and see what kind of radios were in this, these vehicles, because uh, I'm sure there were some. So um, 
the ceasefire was going to be signed um, at or come into effect at eight o'clock on January 28th. So um, we got a lot of intel the day before or, or a couple of days before saying there was going to be a big attack on some fire bases down near Chulai, which was down south of us. So we actually flew down there um, and, uh, and slept over in the birds and then got up at first light um, and, and, and flew around. And uh, we, there was an attack and we did break the attack. Um, and uh, Big Voice came on the radio at 8 a.m. and said, uh, ceasefire, the, the unilateral ceasefire is now in effect. And uh, I've always wondered where the uh, intel uh, came from uh, of this. So, so we started standing down, took a couple of weeks. One of the uh, tasks I was on was to gather up all the radios and furniture and weapons all around uh, our base and ammunition and load it up into two connexes and, and uh, chain them up and lock them, and, uh, which we did. And um, we figured we were gonna, they were going to give them to the South Vietnamese. Well, a Chinook shows up, hooks up the first one, takes it out <laughs> over the South China Sea about eight miles out and drops it. Big, big splash. Came back and got the other one. So, uh, um, and um, after we stood down, um, I ended up going down to Da Nang to help guard the, uh, the perimeter uh, back in the towers again. Um, and the reason why Americans were still there, uh, the big POW exchanges were happening, and some of the pilots that I had flown with were, were taking around North and South Vietnamese and VC um, representatives uh, observing the, the POW exchanges. And here's a couple of pictures one of the pilots gave me uh, where you had the South Vietnamese on one side of the river around Quan Tri and the uh, North Vietnamese uh, on the other side of the river. The funny thing is the uh, North Vietnamese would dress up all the South Vietnamese prisoners in North Vietnamese uh, uniforms, including pith helmets. And the South Vietnamese did the same thing to their North Vietnamese uh, um, uh, captives. And then they, um, they sent them out by boat to the other side. And when everybody got right in the middle, uh, they said everybody would strip off their uniforms and ended up in their skivvies. So. Uh, uh, it was an interesting, uh, an interesting thing. So, so March 28th, we had to be out by the 30th. So my Freedom Bird came on the 28th, heading home. Once I got back, of course, life, life happened. Went to college, got married, kids, work, more kids, more work, and so I needed a hobby. We um, were lucky to have a uh, uh, a strong interest in. Um, antique radios uh, starting even around 1975 here in Charlotte and here's some pictures of, uh, of a meet we held in uh, in 1978. Um, Ralph Williams, Mr. Atwater Kent actually came down to speak that year so we were learning from the best. At that meet or one earlier I remember buying my first antique radio which was a radio excuse me an AK-20 and I was uh, once I bought it for $75 I was just floating on air uh, now, later on, I kind of uh, uh, gravitated over toward RCAs, early RCAs and GE and wireless specialty radios. And so um, my tastes have always been changing. Uh, you know, over the last 45 or 50 years, uh, they've continued to change. Uh, I end up being a World War II German and Japanese military radio collector. The problem with that is there's very few translated manuals. There's also very little uh, information on the web. I also like your early nationals. Uh, and, and more than anything else, I collect radio pictures. And, and I love to hear uh, about a historically significant radio that has a great story uh, around it. And um, uh, so anyway, um, and uh, recently I've gotten interested in uh, the radios of the Vietnam War, and, and more specifically, the enemy radios of the Vietnam War. So that's why this presentation. One of the sources of information out on the web for German and Japanese radios, and also um, radios used during Vietnam, is uh, William Howard, or Bill Howard. He was a big collector. He was an intelligence guy in Vietnam. Um, so he, would, uh, he was part of a uh, combined material exploitation uh, team so they would go out after battles and look at all the 
uh, equipment and uh, figure out what's new and what needed to be, uh, what information needed to be um, sent around to the other folks in country. And uh, here's a picture of Bill um, with the only Soviet radio he, he says he ever saw in Vietnam. And this was a big Navy radio, very heavy, and uh, he, he, thinks it, he thought it was a fluke. So, um, luckily, um, Bill liked to uh, write things down. So, we, so there's still some really good pages out on the web. Uh, for example, this one, Communications Equipment of the North Vietnamese Army in the VC. And we're gonna talk about uh, many of these uh, radios. I've always kept my ear to the ground regarding Bill Howard. Um, he passed away back in uh, 2008 and 99% uh, of his collection just disappeared. Um, every once in a while, something shows up or some document that he wrote shows up. But um, I was able to get a number of pieces and also um, like 99 file cabinets full of his documentation from a defunct, uh, a different defunct museum down in Florida uh, where Bill had donated this stuff. Um, uh, so I'm still going through the paper, by the way. That's my goal for this winter. Uh, in the file cabinets, for example, were uh, pictures of Bill's very extensive collection, uh, pretty much at its peak in 2005. And I have these up on the web uh, already. Here's one of the pictures. It just talks about where Bill was in country and uh, the types of equipment that he um, um, came across and, and wrote up reports on and that type of thing. Here's another document from the file cabinets, communications equipment of the North Vietnamese Army in Viet Cong. And a lot of this information is the same that's up on the web, but it's, it's nice to have this documentation. Around that time, um, I read a book called Unlikely Warriors, the Army Security Agency's Secret War in Vietnam from 61 to 73. And uh, quite frankly, I did not know. Uh, I, I know very little of that. And uh, so this has been a very um, fun project, kind of coming up to speed. Not that I'm an expert, but uh, um, you know, this is a more like a starter presentation about the ASA. But they did uh, a lot of radio direction finding, traffic analysis, intercepts in Vietnam. And in fact, the book says uh, this was the best intel of the war. Um, Here's some uh, of the uh, ASA um, MOSs, or Military Occupational Specialties, in, including Morse Intercept Operator, for example, which they called, uh, uh, one of the names was Diddy Bopper. So, so let's talk about radios used by the French during the, their um, uh, post-World War II uh, re-entry into Vietnam. Of course, they were using a lot of military surplus. Uh, we, we funded uh, some, something like 90% of that war, um, uh, you know, unfortunately or unfortunately. Here's um, BC-1000s or SCR-300s, also known, uh, which are uh, VHF sets. Um, you know. uh, here's another picture of one in use. And uh, here's some also some other surplus. You know, it looks like a, a BC-312. Um, receiver and also a BC-375 or 191 transmitter over there, which would be, uh, they, they use these in, um, you know, the back of trucks, but they also used versions of these uh, up in aircraft. Here's another good picture of, a, of, the, uh, of the transmitter with the 211 tubes in it. Uh, around that same time, um, I was made aware of a site called Enemy Militaria, and um, so I, I check it out from time to time. And uh, I missed this item. Uh, it sold before I saw it. It was the North Vietnamese Army Viet Cong Radio Operator's Diary, dated 1967. And um, luckily, they took pictures of every page and posted them on this site. So I certainly grabbed the pictures and started trying to figure out, you know, what radios uh, it covered. Um, one it covered was a GRC-9. Uh, of course, the, the French um, had lots of GRC-9s that we gave them. Uh, here, it's at Dien Bien Phu. They're using the radio to talk to the C-47 uh, that's dropping supplies behind them. Um, we also gave them the planes, of course. Um, here's a GRC-9 being used by 
Army Special Forces in advisors early on in the war, 1964, the American War. Here's a quick video saying that the Viet Cong also used GRC-9s. The Viet Cong headquarters is in no one place. It moves constantly, and when it moves, it takes its defense force with it. These pictures, while obviously posed for the camera, still do depict the extremes of mobility which the Viet Cong rely upon for concealment. From the air, these are peaceful fishing boats in the Mekong Delta. But they actually are the general headquarters of the communist forces, the Viet Cong Pentagon. South Vietnamese counterintelligence worries a lot about the location of the communist underground radio. Well, here it is. Or there it was. It moves too. Here's another picture of a North Vietnamese radio operator uh, using a, a GRC-9. So we were listening to them. They were listening to us. William Howard also came across a GRC-9 that had been captured by the Viet Cong uh, and repurposed, and then they captured it back um, uh, later on. So uh, they were on both sides. I have one in my collection here, and you can see the generator um, in, in, uh, in the front. Of course, the generator only ran the transmitter. You still needed to run the uh, receiver off of uh, a battery, batteries. Here's a, uh, a quick demo of my GRC-9. Here's my test GRC-9 setup. I'm lucky to have an AC power supply to use. There's the speaker and the top waterproof cover. And here's the uh, here's GRC-9. Got a little power meter mounted. Right now it's going into a dummy load. So let's see if we can see it making fire here. So the meter was showing eight watts on CW, but depending on which band and what frequency it was on, I, I've seen it produce as, as much as 15 watts out on CW. Here's a, a little bit on, on AM. Okay, now I've switched to high-powered AM. Hello test, hello test, hello test. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. KN four R. So I think that's showing six watts uh, on high power. For, uh, for AM. Here's a quick QSO I had actually last night with uh, a group of guys. We have an, uh, an old friend's net on AM um, three times a week, and uh, this is just a little, a little tidbit of that. You're holding at five and nine uh, with a little QSB up and down, but uh, no, nothing consequential. Uh, you, you just, uh, you sound really good. And Mir's about, oh, an hour and a half driving time from me down in South Carolina. So probably uh, uh, s at least 60 air miles. So another radio mentioned in the uh, radio operator's diary was the 102E. Now here's a, uh, so that was, it was a transmitter, but it was also what they called a, um, a transceiver um, that had this transmitter and a receiver in one box. So uh, it's a little confusing, but here's a 102E transmitter actually with Vietnamese markings. And this, this came from the web. Uh, you'll notice on the data tag, it says May Fat 102E. And, and so in the, in the um, radio operator's diary, it was saying May and then 102E. So these are very rare to actually see one with Vietnamese writing on it instead of, instead of Chinese. Here's a picture, very rare picture, of the Viet Cong um, CW radio operator using um, a 102E transceiver. Um, or um, there was a, a later model called an XD6, but they're basically the same uh, radios. Here's a quick video of one of these transceivers being used at, um, at Way during Tet of 1968. 324th Division of the North Vietnamese Army had been given the task of taking Hue. 
Its 4th Regiment attacked from the northwest down the left bank of the Perfume River, while the 6th Regiment moved up the opposite side of the river, attacking from the southwest. The Citadel itself was seized by a North Vietnamese battalion. So, more information from Bill Howard. He talks about the Chinese Type 102E, also called the XD6 radio station, and you can see some of these. They, uh, they, they look very similar. Um, basically, um, this was modeled after the GRC-9. Um, many of the tubes are interchangeable. For example, the microphone and the headphones and the keys are also interchangeable. And uh, it says here it's a 15-watt set with a range of 75 miles. Well, that depends on the antenna and the frequency. It can go much farther, actually. So... I'm a member of a Facebook group um, called the uh, Radio Telephone Operators, or RTOs of the Vietnam War, uh, by virtue of working in the, the Fire Direction Center and all the radios there. And uh, here's an interesting picture that showed up uh, recently. Uh, a fellow posted it said, some sort of enemy radio slash computer found by uh, one of the units of the 101st Airborne in the Aishaw Valley, which is a very bad valley, by the way, over by the, uh, the trail. Uh, <laughs> And uh, in 1970, so as you see, um, it's a 102E or an XD6 uh, set. Here's um, a set actually being studied uh, by a ASA unit, a radio research unit at Da Nang in 1969. And the, the larger um, piece is the 102E transmitter, and over to the left is the uh, model 137 or uh, 139 uh, receiver. Um, now, uh, a couple years ago on Craigslist, this interesting posting showed up. Basically, there was a retired Army guy who apparently didn't have any family. He lived in Michigan, and um, uh, when he passed away, the house went up for sale uh, with all the contents, and uh, all this military gear was found in the attic. So the the fellows who had the realtors who had bought the house, they were intending to flip the house. They um, once they found this stuff, they started posting it on on um, Craigslist. Well, I could not afford the uniform, the medals, any of that kind of stuff. But for some reason, they were <laughs> they were very negotiable on the radio, and I ended up getting it for like two hundred dollars plus shipping, and that's with all the spares and and that type of thing. And so, you know, one question is, was, was this a, a, a war surplus radio, or did the, uh, the chaplain actually bring it home uh, during the war? And it did have a front cover, but if you take the front cover off and you look very, very closely at the front, there's uh, some very fine red, red dust all over the unit. So that tells me it actually did come home and uh, was not a, uh, a, a war surplus. Um, there was a lot of war surplus that came out around the 2000s, 2005. I'll talk about that. But there, all that equipment's more of a medium green. This is more of a gray, uh, gray color. So uh, I looked at the gentleman's uniform, and I said, okay, his name was Phelps. And I knew the, um, it was in Michigan, the house was. And I asked the guy what the address of the house was. And then I, I said, okay, I checked it all out on QRZ, found out that uh, this gentleman was a, a silent key. He was a ham, K-A-P-E-P. -E -P. So that all kind of made sense. So basically, uh, he acquired the radio in Vietnam somehow, um, and, uh, and brought it home with the intention of using it on the air, but I don't think he ever did. Of course, it came with original Chinese documentation, which is always a problem, uh, be it a, a German radio, a Japanese military radio, or now Chinese uh, military radios. Luckily, uh, because of um, a lot of these units being released um, in the early 2000s and sold by a company called Red Star Radio, up in Toronto, um, they, um, these radios were available for, for sale, and uh, each one of them came with an English translation of those manuals, which is really nice, and I have a copy of that. Also, uh, Dr. Ken Lakin, KD6B, he was a longtime Antique Wireless Association member, contributing member, and uh, he also uh, wrote... Um, a technical manual for the Chinese Army Type 102E transmitter and receiver, which was great, uh, and I have a copy of that as well. You can also find that on the web and download it. So it's a, you know, it really, really helps the uh, um, 
you know, the, um, this, this type of equipment. I, there were also separate radios where the 102E transmitter was separate and the receiver was in its own case. And uh, I was able to purchase uh, such a set from uh, another member of the old military radio group, G. Platt, K3HVG. Um, oh, and by the way, there is an export model of the 102E or XD6 transceiver with English markings. And uh, so I've never seen one in person, but uh, they must be out there because I found this picture on the web. And also notice the, uh, the, the, the key there. It's a, it's a chrome-based key with a red knob. So uh, not my idea of a military key, but I guess that's what it was. So, um, so I was able to... Um, so Red Star Radio also sold these separate uh, units um, uh, for a time as well. Um, luckily, Jeep... K3HVG had made a nice power supply that would power both the transmitter and the receiver, and he also figured out how to uh, net them together um, uh, so that you'd have side tone and, and that type of thing. So he did a really nice job. And um, So here's a, a quick test. I use them on the air, and uh, they have it actually has very good audio. Here I'm testing. I have a remote receiver, uh, you know, across the room. So I'm just checking the audio. Hello test, hello test, hello test, hello test. Kilowatt, November 4, Romeo, KN4R. We also have an old military radio net Saturday mornings from 5 to 7 a.m. Eastern. And we have G GRC9s check in, and I thought it'd be nice to also uh, have these on there. So here's a quick QSO about that. So here's a couple of the Chinese keys. There, here's a, a another chrome key with a black knob, and you see these on eBay for roughly fifty dollars. Uh, you know, all the time. So they made a whole bunch of them. The other key um, actually came with a, a different set. We're going to talk about a second uh, called a seventy-one type seventy-one. Here's a, an interesting. Looks like a homemade key uh, that was actually found uh, by somebody in the twenty-fifth uh, infantry. Uh, down in what they called the Hobo Woods, which is outside of Saigon in 1966. So interesting for code collectors, for key collectors out there. So here's my separates, the 102E transmitter and the 139 receiver uh, doing some CW. Again, this is the same type of power as the GRC9, roughly 15 watts on CW and 6 to 8 watts on, on AM. Here's the receiver. Um, pretty nice little receiver, actually. No S meter or anything like that, but sounds real nice. So back to the um, radio operator's diary, it mentions another unit called a 71B. Here's a uh, North Vietnamese CW operator actually operating a 71B. Uh, William Howard has some information out there about it. And again, it's, it's just a different kind of clone of the, uh, of the GRC-9, still in that same power class. Actually, this is a little bit lower because it typically ran off of batteries, dry batteries. Bill Howard had one in his collection. It showed up on Worth Point. Uh, of course, I didn't see it at the time, but uh, somebody bought it. And uh, But it is nice to see um, 
it coming from uh, Bill Howard's collection. The site I mentioned earlier, Enemy Militaria, um, last time I checked had two uh, 71Bs uh, available, and uh, uh, this one's supposedly with a little bit of da uh, battle damage. Now, there's no good English documentation yet for the 71B, which kind of holds up, uh, plus they're very rare radios over here. I'm not sure if they were sold surplus or not. Um, I got mine actually from a Chinese ham through a, uh, a California ham um, contact that I have. So uh, I had to trade a 75A4 and speaker for it, but uh, I'm glad I made the trade. And my, uh, my friend in California, he's a med student, um, uh, Chinese-American uh, ham, and uh, he kindly translated the, uh, the front panel markings for me, so at least I have a start in terms of uh, understanding what does what. I have not fired this up yet, but, uh, but I plan to. Back to the, the uh, diary, uh, it mentions a Model 63. Here's the Type 63 backpack radio, thanks to Bill Howard. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it was it not written to a two watt transmitter covered 1.5 to 6 megacycles and um, it, it did um, CW or or AM. Here's Bill Howard um, holding one that he had in his collection that happened to have 26 bullet holes in it. And I have not seen this one show up for sale yet. Um, they are available through enemy militaria. Um, so uh, I have not uh, bit the bullet and bought one yet, but um, I've been thinking about it. By the way, this particular site sometimes has 40% off sales, so I kind of um, keep my eye open when I get a notice uh, from them about that. There was also um, um, some high-powered, high-frequency radios. Um, the 601C transmitter, which I have very little information on and never seen a picture and it was used with a 7512 receiver, and there is some information about that on the web. But again, they're covering about the same together, 2 to 12 megacycles, um, but just higher power. So it, this would be used by a, a, a major headquarters, uh, somebody with a, with, you know, with a generator, and that type of thing. Here's a nice website that talks about uh, various Chinese military radios and uh, shows a picture of the uh, 7512. It also mentions that the next receiver that probably came out post-Vietnam was a Type 222 receiver, and it was all solid state. So this was the last of their tube receivers, apparently. Now, they also had other radios that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with. Uh, for example, they had a, a um, 702 series radios that was inspired, basically, uh, you know, somewhat of a copy of our BC-611 uh, handy talkies of World War II era. These were uh, high frequency, though very low powered, 100 milliwatts uh, typically. Um, if you do try to find a, um, a BC-611, I would recommend you try to find one that is already set up on 3885, which is the uh, most popular uh, uh, AM frequency. Um, there was a lot of other, you'll see a, a bunch of them on five, five megacycles and that kind of thing, but there, it's, it's quite a bit of work to, to change the frequency of one of these. So I'd look for the one that says 3885. So let's talk about VHF radios a little bit. The diary mentions the Prick 10. Well, that was an American radio that predated the Prick 27, 25 and the 77s. Uh, it was our standard um, radio. There was actually a Prick 8, Prick 9, Prick 10. They all um, covered slightly different ranges, but they all overlapped. Uh, the 10 was used by infantry, the 9 by artillery, the 8 by armored units. But they, again, they had a way of talking to uh, um, the other uh, groups here. So, uh, and of course, uh, if we had it, eventually the, uh, the enemy had them as well. And there was also a PRC-6 low-powered uh, uh, radio that uh, worked on the same frequencies as the, the PRC-10. Here's a Chinese Type 883 VHF radio. I've never seen one of these in person, 
but this is uh, more information from Bill Howard. Doesn't sound very exciting uh, or very powerful in terms of being a VHF uh, radio. So uh, looks like it covered uh, 45 to 50 megahertz. So it would be somewhat uh, interoperable with a with a Prick 10, for example. I have in my collection a Type 884, which came out right at the end of the Vietnam War. And uh, again, 45 to 50 megacycles. Um, uh, you know, not much range. Um, you know, very nicely made, uh, just uh, kind of a strange set once you've seen an American Prick 25. Um, here's an unidentified radio in a, in a propaganda picture that uh, I have not identified which radio this is, but I'm pretty sure it's a VHF type radio. Here's another picture. I still have not identified those radios either. These could be 63s or they could be that same VHF radio that we just saw in the preceding picture. So, so uh, General Creighton Abrams, who was head of over the Army in Vietnam when I was there, um, he said about the Prick 25, uh, it was the single most important tactical field item in Vietnam, and I tend to agree. It was a very nice uh, unit. Um, the Prick 77 was an improved Prick 25. Uh, it, uh, the Prick 25 had a um, one tube in the final, which means that the battery had to have uh, uh, some extra power to light up the filaments of that, of that uh, tube. Whereas with the 77, it was all solid state. So it could be more easily run off of just straight 12 volts from the front uh, power connector, for example. The earlier PRC 25s, um, they found out after they were out that they had a little bit of intermod if they were used in close proximity with others. And it turns out, uh, you know, they were. So uh, uh, they fixed that uh, better shielding in the Prick 77. Also, towards the end of the war, um, encrypted voice um, communications was necessary. And so uh, over to the far right, you can see a, um, um, a, a Prick 77 on top with a KY-38 Nestor unit underneath. So that, that was quite a, uh, a load for the, uh, for the radio operator. Uh, the main thing to remember is that both Prick 25s and Prick 77s were highly prized by the enemy. Uh, they would steal them, they would buy them on the black market, they would capture them. I heard that there was people whose sole function was to go out and try to obtain uh, our radios. So they really loved our VHF radios. And of course, these were used everywhere in close proximity. In this particular picture, there's four of them. And of course, the, uh, the armored personnel carrier in the far background, it also had its own set of higher powered um, interoperable radios that they, with, instead of the PRC, they were VRC, uh, like the 524 and that type of thing. So, and of course, here's, uh, here's multiple uh, PRC 2577s together. You could pretty well tell who was important in Vietnam, uh, depending on how many radios they had uh, surrounding them. Uh, you know, if somebody was carrying a radio, he was going somewhere, and if he had three or four, that was really a big deal. In this picture, there's three right together, and then there's another spare over uh, in the backpack over to the left. So, so let's talk about the ASA in Vietnam a bit. Um, you know, when I was there, I didn't think we, we uh, really knew the enemy. And this, this poster was from the Bill Howard collection, by the way, and I have it on my wall. You know, we, uh, most of us didn't know Vietnamese. Uh, it was hard to tell friend or foe. Um, you know, it really took five or six months to get your head squared away once you got in country and to become really productive. And, uh, and of course, you were there for a year typically unless you extended, which, which means, you know, you, you came in and, uh, you know, you were gone pretty soon. So that was kind of, uh, um, um, wasn't very helpful. And of course, we didn't know the area of operations like the, uh, the locals did. So we were at, at a disadvantage, that's for sure. So the Army Security Agency arrived in Vietnam May 14, 1961, back, back when we were sending in our earliest advisors to help train the South Vietnamese Army on, uh, you know, on, our, on our typical uh, infantry weapons like the M1 Garand and the M1 Carbine and the 30 cal machine gun, the 50 cal, and that kind of thing. So uh, 
their job, of course, uh, was to intercept Viet Cong and North Vietnamese electronic communications and use them to locate the communist troops. And they called their units radio research to try to conceal their, their true purpose. And you can see here we have a couple of Diddy Boppers listening to R392s and sitting in front of their meals um, ready to type up whatever they hear on the radio. So this was the, the backbone of the, of the ASA. The ASA had fixed DF sites, um, such as this uh, um, picture here. They also used large intercept receivers, um, R390, R390A, R392s, R391s. Um, the R391 was a motorized version of the R390 and R390A, and um, it, uh, it could have 10 preset channels that you could set through the, uh, the locking levers on the, the two big knobs. So that, and it also has a separate power supply as well. Um, of course, the R392 is green over, <laughs> over to the right. The R390 uh, was the original uh, receiver like this. If you look above the mechanical dial, there is no knob, uh, antenna tuning knob, whereas the R390A was a, um, it was a remanufactured R390. It, uh, it had a couple less, uh, fewer tubes, but it was much more modular, much more repairable than the original R390 uh, was. Also, one big difference, um, the R390 used LC filters circuits in instead of mechanical filters. Uh, some of the purists think, for example, on AM, the mechanical filters can be somewhat uh, restrictive. So um, uh, the ham radio operators, R390As are great, but uh, some people um, like, like prefer the R390, the earlier model, instead because of that. Now, this, the Australians were also in Vietnam, and they had their own signal core. And uh, here's a picture of uh, uh, their, some intercept operators in there, what they call the set room. And uh, uh, it's hard to tell, but these are actually R391s that they're using at all these uh, different stations. So, um, and here's a couple of North Vietnamese uh, listening to our signals. And of course, um, our infantry divisions um, from time to time would find enemy listening posts, which typically would be a, uh, a bunker or a, uh, a, a cave complex, um, you know, with an antenna sticking out of some sort and maybe some telephone wires coming out. And, uh, but uh, inside, of course, you would see um, all the various radios that we had, you know, Prick 25s and 77s, and also uh, some of the Chinese radios, like a, a 102E, for example, would be there as well. So, now the main um, radio direction finding receiver um, used by the ASA in Vietnam was the PRD1, which is a rather heavy set, comes in like four wooden cases. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it takes a couple of guys to set it up, or one guy, one strong guy to set it up. Typically, um, there were mounts, there were Jeep mounts for these radios, and also I think a mount for a three-quarter ton truck as well. So that would be a better way of doing it. Um, here's a very early picture of um, the third radio research unit, ASA, in, in Vietnam. They've got a PRD-1 set up in the field. They're actually showing it and uh, helping to train some South Vietnamese uh, troops uh, in, in the use. So here's a picture of a PRD-1 mounted, mounted in a Jeep. Now, I've been told that um, PRD-1 was an effective radio direction finding receiver uh, if you were within 8 to 10 miles of a target. In other words, uh, ground wave. Um, and um, so, now the first American combat casualty was um, um, James Tom Davis. Um, he was an ASA guy, and he was uh, ambushed along with some uh, uh, South Vietnamese. They were going out to set up a PRD-1 and, uh, and take some readings. Um, so they named the first radio research um, station in Vietnam uh, the Davis Station uh, uh, in, uh, in memorial of that. Now, 
Here's uh, the status of ASA units in Vietnam, probably at about the heyday, uh, uh, late 1968. You can see up and down the country, there's various um, radio research groups uh, um, in support of pretty much all the uh, infantry divisions uh, um, in their particular area. So quite a few, quite a few folks in the ASA there. So they started off with ground radio direction finding, but they found out pretty quickly that they had to be pretty close uh, to, um, to, you know, to, to generate any good information. So they said, we've got to be airborne with these uh, uh, systems. And uh, it, the, the airborne aspects was very, very successful. They used a, a variety of different aircraft. We're going to show you a few here. But... Uh, the bottom line is that once they got their act together and were doing aerial radio direction finding, um, they were providing 80 to 85 percent of the intelligence um, in Vietnam. So uh, that's pretty impressive. Of course, they had to have good air ground coordination between the aircraft and the folks on the ground. Here's a couple of guys. Uh, um, one guy's a tip-off guy, and one guy's uh, actually doing the copying and typing it up on the meal uh, there. So the thing about airborne radio direction at, at first is the pilot had to fly toward the incoming signal. And of course, the pilot also had to take multiple fixes uh, or to get multiple bearings to the target so that they could interpolate that and put it all together to actually find a, a fix um, where they thought the enemy was. And typically what you'd find is these airplanes had two vertical dipoles um, on their, one on each wing. Um, so. Here's um, supposedly the first aerial setup in a called a U-6. You know, plane was a Beamer, and you, if you look there, you can see a, an R-390 uh, in the passenger seat there. Not much room. Army also experimented with a with a very large uh, Navy P-2V Neptune aircraft as an electronic war warfare platform for a while. Here's another larger aircraft that they, they did the same thing with. This was a uh, uh, de Havilland Caribou. Um, supposedly this was one of a kind. If you look real closely, you can see some vertical antennas come off that plane on, on, in different places. Here's a um, supposedly um, one of the first very productive, uh, successful airborne collection platforms in Vietnam. And you can very clearly see the two vertical dipoles um, there on the front of each wing. And again, they, they flew, toward the, uh, uh, flew toward the target. And they, uh, with the receivers on board, they attempted to get a null um, uh, that would tell them the direction of the, the transmitter. And then they'd fly over and try to take another bearing from another direction. There was also helicopters used for this. Um, one was Project Left Bank, very successful. Uh, and you can see a very unique uh, antenna sticking out from the front of this helicopter. And uh, they called it the Elephant Brander. So um, Left Bank was different. Uh, up, to then, up, up to now, the, um, the ASA would gather information and run it back through ASA headquarters. And then the headquarters would distribute the information back out to the various uh, uh, infantry divisions and that sort of thing. They wanted to speed that whole process up. So they actually assigned the uh, left bank helicopters, assigned them directly to the 1st Cav or 4th or Infantry Divisions, and they were flown by division pilots and the uh, onboard ASA operators. You know, their job was to locate um, um, time-sensitive threats, um, and if, and if you know, they'd help to make the decision, uh, did we just, you know, are we just um, tracking a, a particular unit or, you know, is this a situation where we need to actually target the threat? And so they, they were in the decision-making process. And uh, so it made the, the whole process, if you couple that with, um, with a hunter-killer helicopter group, for example, or artillery, or even B-52 strikes and that type of thing, um, it gave them a, a much faster way of responding to, uh, to, to threats. And they got a lot of credit for, uh, uh, you know, for being um, 
you know, not so much a passive organization, but, but very active in the whole process. And uh, the, uh, the infantry divisions really liked, uh, really liked left bank. Here's a picture of an operator in the uh, left bank helicopter. Apparently this was a, one large module that was just kind of, um, you know, designed to fit right into the helicopter, the UE. And uh, so their job was to find the enemy. And then uh, if, a, if an attack was warranted, uh, to help stay on station and help to direct the attack. And, um, and again, they could, you know, they could respond with a B-52 strike, call in a B-52 strike or artillery or, uh, or any, any sort of thing. And, of course, the ASA did, um, did lose some of these helicopters uh, uh, due to enemy fire. Um, left Bank was um, uh, credited with finding Cosvin. Cosvin was the... Uh, the Viet Cong headquarters, which had moved from the, uh, the Delta, as we saw in that original video, over into Cambodia. So when we had the Cambodian incursion, of course, one of the targets was to find Cosvin. And they did find Cosvin, thanks to a left bank um, aerial radio direction finding. Um, they also, uh, the, the folks there, so they found the facilities and, and the caches of equipment and all that, but the actual people um, had prior warning, and um, they they stayed ahead um, as uh, you know as we our forces advanced. But uh, uh, Left Bank was able to track those transmitters uh, as they um, as they retreated, um, and uh, keep keep track of the the units by that uh, method. Here's a, another system, uh, an RU-8D um, Seminole aircraft. You can, you can see one of the, uh, um, uh, the uh, vertical dipole antennas over on the other side of the wing. I love this logo, this downward-looking uh, Pink Panther logo. Tr terrific. Here's the older wing configuration where you, you can definitely see the, uh, the uh, dipole, uh, vertical dipole antenna through the right wing there. Um, this evolved into a, a later version called the wine bottle, and you can see the uh, now the very distinctive vertical dipoles on, on each wing, which are um, they're they're more substantive than the uh, just a just a, a, a single vertical uh, antenna. And you can also see a, a number of other interesting antennas on this aircraft as well. So now. Um, in the National Cryptologic Museum, there's a display that says this is the, uh, the receiver stack from an RU-8D. And uh, if you look very closely, you can see two Collins 51S1's receivers. And uh, here uh, is a picture of, uh, of a radio repair unit there at, uh, I think it was at Da Nang, 1969. And this, this gentleman's working on a 51S1, and he told me that his his responsibility was to work on the receiver stack. So the, the 51 S1s on the bench. They also had some Marconi uh, um, um, uh, radar and, and other systems as well. So, so um, here's uh, the next uh, aerial platform, which was called Laughing Eagle. And it was based on a, uh, a, a different, larger, uh, roomier aircraft, faster, um, you know, it had faster speed and climb and uh, better range. It was much roomier, so it could handle more, um, more equipment. Um, this plane was capable not only of radio direction finding, but also of collection. So they were recording low-level uh, voice communications to tape, and then they'd send the tape back for uh, processing from other folks, even back to the United States. This, uh, this aircraft also could obtain um, faster radio direction finding fixes, and, uh, and the plane did not have to fly directly toward the transmitter. So uh, um, the pilot did his thing, and the, um, the ASA uh, guy in the back did his thing. And, um, and then it, it even got improved even, even further uh, later on with a newer RDF system and improved navigation. And um, it, it says here that Laughing Eagle was credited with uh, intercepting, uh, you know, 
uh, elements of the NBA First Division, and uh, they were planning on a 1969 Tet, and, and uh, Laughing Eagle um, helped to um, neutralize that. And uh, part of that was by able to, uh, uh, for the first time, listen in to the low-powered voice transmitters um, used by the VC. And um, I'm assuming this was HF and NVHF. Now, the most sophisticated um, aerial platform used by the ASA in Vietnam was the uh, U-21A uh, called Left Jab. And it had this interesting uh, ray dome with a spinning space loop inside that would get lowered, uh, lowered in flight. So this, this had an automatic 360 degree direction finding capability. And it was also the first to have a digital computer on board to, to process and store that, uh, that information. So it could very quickly uh, uh, come up with uh, uh, RDF uh, fixes and bearings and uh, in fact, uh, this article says that uh, this new platform was years ahead of anything else uh, world in the world. So, uh, but you know, the ASA also had a number of other groups. I just want to mention them lightly. Here's a traffic analysis section. Here's an operator uh, using a TRD-23 direction finding that's inside a metal shelter. Voice intercept was a big deal, and of course, locals were needed for the most part to do that work because they, they knew the language the best. So this was a very important uh, uh, piece of the uh, transcribing the uh, low-level voice communications that were uh, picked up by Laughing Eagle, for example. Of course, uh, they could also do transmitter fingerprinting, though most of the ASA operators that I've talked to, the Diddy Boppers, they said they could tell, um, you know, they, they knew their their guys. They listened to them day after day on a regular schedule and that they were, uh, the enemy was very prompt in their radio communications and uh, they could tell if, the, you know, if it was the same guy in the same transmitter. They also was, re ASA was responsible for communication security. So they, uh, they monitored everything, uh, the, the, you know, all the U.S. forces, also the South Vietnamese forces for uh, any type of security violation. So, um, the ASC finally leaves Vietnam uh, on March 7th, 1973. And um, General Abrams is quoted as saying that the Army Security Agency saved more American lives than any other unit because it could tell where the NVA was, at what strength, and what they were going to do. Um, but uh, So they were the eyes and ears of the U.S. military commanders during the Vietnam War. Of course, there was a heavy price paid and um, here's a picture of the losses, uh, ASA losses in Vietnam. So, so further reading, uh, here's a nice website about Chinese military radios. Great document called The Most Secret Wars, uh, available on the web in PDF form, um, Army Signals Intelligence in Vietnam. Also this great book, Unlikely Warriors, I highly recommend it. Also there's a terrific Facebook group, um, a lot of lot of XASA folks uh, commenting and uh, supplying pictures uh, uh, about their you know what they what they did and used in Vietnam. Another great article from the U.S. Army website on more more on aerial intelligence systems used during the Vietnam War. That's a uh, a left jab helicopter there with the uh, elephant brander antenna. Terrific website, especially if you're ex-ASA, called asalives.org. Great place to meet others. There's also a, a Facebook group, and this is showing a uh, Well and Wilbur um, fixed uh, uh, high-frequency radio direction finding site. Um, I don't think there was one in Vietnam, but there was, there was a number of these all around the world. Now, by special permission, I'm going to play the ASA anthem, which is a song written by Joel Warren and performed by Joel and his two sons, John and Dave, which actually have an American rock band called Reliant K. And um, here are the lyrics. And if you look at the lyrics, um, you know, you get a really good sense of, of, uh, 
of the, the ASA, the day-to-day, -day, if you will. And uh, I think it's a terrific song. Ever since I heard this song, I can't get it out of my head. So I hope you agree. And uh, as, as it plays, um, take a look at the, uh, the lyrics. There's also a, a, a bit of Morse code inter, interspersed uh, in the lyrics, uh, actually played by a musical keyboard. And um, I'm going to turn up the volume a bit, so hopefully you can hear that. And, uh, but I, th I think it's just a terrific, uh, a terrific uh, tribute to the ASA. So here goes. <laughs>
Here's the Morse code in the song. Special thanks to all these folks for assisting with this presentation. Couldn't have done it with all, with, without them. Also, a number of uh, different uh, web locations. Um, also, very appreciative of uh, the information there as well. Thank you for watching, and thank you for supporting the Antique Wireless Association. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.